one hard part about security is that it's a neg is about securities in controlling access is that it's a negative goal. So who can tell me what a negative goal means? Well, yeah, I mean it's it's this it's this weird thing where you can't you can't prove. I mean it's easy if it's a positive goal, then you can do it. You can have some results that say yes, this occurred, and then you can say yes. It's a positive goal, but to, to prove that someone didn't auth didn't access something without authorization, how do you prove that? Well, it's it's I mean, you, you, what's that? No, but how do you prove it in general? Like, how do you can you be absolutely sure that 100%? Can you give a proof that something wasn't accessed in some way? And, <laughs> It's like, I mean, yes. It's, so this is, um, this is a, in, in experimental sciences, it's called a negative result, which, or in, in, here, in this case, it's a negative goal. Um, and you, can't, you, can, you can prove that someone did access it if you have some kind of log file or something that tells you that someone acts and violated security. But you can't ever prove that someone didn't. Right? The only way, I mean, it's, you just, you, you can, a million years from now, you might find out that the, the one secret that you thought you had, you know, was known, was known by a group of people that you never knew. So there's lots of examples of security techniques, and I think you've seen some of these. Um, one is uh, tickets in general. So there's a, and it follows very much the ticket model where if you want to control access to something, like a concert, you give someone a ticket and they come in. Um, do you guys do anything with Kerberos, the MIT? Okay, in the Kerberos system, which is an authentication, uh, authentication system that was developed uh, mostly at MIT, you have the uh, notion of a ticket, which is a, a bit string that has certain fields and is encrypted a certain way that you give to someone, uh, to a computer. When that computer has that ticket, it can then access a set of resources. Um, one of the trade-offs with tickets is that once you give one of these out, it's hard to take it back. <laughs> So, I mean, this is, it's different than the next one, which is an access control list. Access control list says, for every resource, I have a list of who can do what. You know, who's authorized to do what, when, where, why, how. And that is, that, unlike tickets, it's very easy to, to deauthorize someone or, or, or some action by going to that one access control list, which you control and changing that. Um, encryption, I heard you guys did RSA. Uh, and you're discreet, and you're discreet. Is that, some people remember it, some people don't. Okay. We did, but look, no. All right. We didn't program for it. Okay. All right, but you get the main ideas of, of you know, encryption. Yes. You can do that, and, and Kerberos has some notion of an expiration date. But if you want to cancel something sooner than that, I mean, then I mean, you can all, you, and you don't want to make it too because too short because then everyone's always grabbing tickets. So that's a trade-off. Um, so PGP, how many of you guys have heard of PGP? Pretty good. Do you guys all have a PGP key? No. Okay. PGP, pretty good privacy. Um, it was it's a program that was developed um, to use a public key infrastructure. It's open source, um, and it's uh, and there was actually this huge fight. Uh, between the author um, of PGP and and the RSA folks over patent infringements and is this is this big mess. But in the end, right now, I mean, MIT actually makes PGP available to anybody, uh, and you can go to the to uh, web.mit.edu and dig in there, and you can get this PGP program and get yourselves keys, and it's free, and it helps you. It's integrated with Eudora, I think. It's it's. Um, if you guys don't have a PGP key, I highly recommend that you get one. Um, EM shielding. Have you guys heard about EM shielding before? Electromagnetic shielding? What's the problem? Um, that's from freaking. Pardon? It's from freaking. Freaking? PHR. Oh, PHR, freaking. Um, well, what, what happens in, in EM, I mean, like this monitor right here, it's giving off EM radiation. And you can build something that sits over here and can probably get a pretty good idea of what's on that screen, just from if you know the technical readouts. Is that what you mean by freaking? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, there is a story that a, that a professor at MIT tells. Um, what's that called? There's a story that a professor at MIT tells about how he was working, he was doing this project um, when he was, he was helping to develop a, um, a fax machine 
and this was uh, this was uh, for the army, and they wanted to be able to transmit, you know, maps and instructions. And the, and they, did, they 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 unlike other folks that tried did a great job, and they were able to fax these things over. And uh, at some point, the the general who's in charge of this says, "This is great and everything, but I want to show you something." And and he takes them over to the room next door and says, "Okay, you know." So in, the, in one room, they had this faxing set up with the machines going back and forth. He takes them over to the room or a truck or something next door, and he says, "He says, look at this." And some guy, he had these technical guys there, and they had an exact copy of the thing that had been transmitted <laughs> on, the, on this machine. So. Things like keyboard clicks, um, EM radiation from the screen, all this kind of thing is information that people can use to, to figure out what, to, to violate your security. Padlocks. Um, it's, it can be very effective at, at some points. If you're a good uh, key pick, um, it probably is a lot less effective. Uh, but it's, nevertheless, it's something that people use. For example, um, a friend of mine who was working in one of these uh, high security government labs, one of their protocols was that um, whenever they came into a room with a secure computer, this computer, by the way, couldn't be connected to, the, it, to any kind of network. Whenever they walked in, this was done for some kind of nuclear simulations, um, they had a padlock on the uh, outlet. So you actually had to get a key to this padlock, open it up, and then plug the computer in. And on your way out, you had to lock it back up and take the key back. So it's it's you know what does this prevent you know what, what level you know what does this prevent well if you it's one more thing that you have to do in order to be able to access that data. Bring yeah, you could bring in a battery, but you know it's, it might unless batteries get a lot smaller, it might become a little bit more obvious. <laughs> but you're right, there's always a way around security. Um, independent certification. So you guys have heard about these hackers who who are hired. You know, ex-hackers maybe went to jail, come out, they make, <laughs> they, they make a lot of money now because people will hire them to try to break into systems. Um, and it's actually, it's ironically, I mean, there's all these stories you hear about it being quite lucrative for some folks. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, the, um, this is the uh, John Rando company, right? Yeah. Rando actually um, was the head of services for... Uh, was digital and now is uh, Compaq. Um, and then that, when he left that, he, I, that's, I heard he came to do the security thing. I forgot he was upstairs. <laughs> um, and then obscurity, we talked about that one. So security is very difficult. Well, let's give you an example of how unintuitive it can be to, 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 be, to make a secure system. Suppose that you're on a computer and that, and that every email message that was coming out of your computer was intercepted by a human and read by a human. So, you know, if you're in some company or some government lab and they're watching every piece of email, they read all the headers, everything. Um, but what you, you had this one gigabyte file you want to get out of there and you decided, oh, well, here's a channel. There's an email channel. Uh, it's the only one I have. I'm going to use this one to get this file out. Um, how can you do that? The, well, you send enough email messages, and, and the, uh, whoever you're sending to knows that the 340th character is going to be a character from this file. Good. So that's the idea of metadata. Imagine that you did something like um, that. So that's one is like say every nth character is going to be you know something that that you put it that corresponds to some part of this file that I'm sending out. <laughs> Another example might be um, by the length of the words. You might say the length of the words of each word it corresponds to a number, right? Well, here's another piece of data that isn't doesn't have any human you know I mean any um, English semantic meaning, but the word has now is the number three, right? Or you could do things like, um, say, the uh, the um, you're going to take you're going to take the whole message and then you're going to count the number of letters of each of each type, right? A's, B's, C's, question marks, and so on, and then use a way to convert that graph that you get out into some piece of information. So there's lots of different ways that you can send it out via metadata that way. And how are you going to how are you going to find you know, how are you going to decipher what they're using if, if, I mean, if they're sending this file out? It's probably not. Again, negative result. When someone sends this email out, you can read it. You can run all sorts of analysis on it. You can <laughs> this thing doesn't like me today. Um, 
he could run all sorts of analysis, but guess what? It's a negative result, so you can't, you're not going to be able to prove very easily that the information didn't get out, which is why when you want to really secure a computer, you just cut it off from the network, because as long as there's a channel going out, like the network, it's, it becomes, that's high speed, it becomes uh, difficult to secure it. Um, now, one thing that you, you'll notice about this approach is it could be, it's effective, but it's much slower. So that's why anything that's a high speed medium is actually, is actually more of a threat than a very low bandwidth medium. So low bandwidth medium might be you walking in, you know, and reading part of this gigabyte file and memorizing it and then walking out and telling someone else about it. Um, that's effective, but it's very low bandwidth. And the, the point there is that data has some time value. Um, and, or secrets can have some time value. So if you might know for, if you know for some secret, like whether the, whether Alan Greenspan's gonna, uh, raise or lower the rates, imagine that he sent out a message and encrypted that, you know, a day before. Uh, well, if you used all the computational power you had available, you might decrypt it, you know, a few days later, but a few days later the data's useless. That secret is useless. So the whole point of, of being able to secure something is to make it to be the case that the amount of energy required to, to break the, the security, the amount of effort required to break it, is going to either be so much that it, uh, that it uh, outweighs the amount of benefit you get back from knowing the data, or that it's going to take so much effort that you're going to, um, that, the, that the secret, uh, is, or the, uh, having access to this resource, once you get it, is going to be something that's useless. So that's a different standard. You don't necessarily want to be 100% secure. And that because of that, it makes things like these, you know, like RSA, uh, something feasible, right? If you use 40-bit RSA and the time value of the data is, you know, a few seconds or, or minutes, even though you can break, say, 40-bit 40 40-bit 40 type of encryption, who cares? That's enough. So there are also some design principles when you're thinking about security. Uh, and it's even more important that you keep that any, if, as you're designing a security into a system that you keep these in mind. First one is keep it small and simple. Okay, why do you want to keep something small when you're building it, like your security system? Why do you want to make it sort of, sort of not, not this huge thing? What happens if you make things bigger? Well, there's more access points, there's more complexity, it becomes harder, more difficult to understand, to look at it and be able to understand it, which means that there's more of a chance that there's someone else is going to be able to find something, something, some way into it. When you think about your defaults, make them fail safe. So for example, it's better to say, I'm, I'm, I have a list and I'm only going to, any people on this list have permission to access this resource, as opposed to saying, here's a list of people who don't have access to it. Right, because the fail, if you forget to put someone on that list, in the first case, they, they won't have permission to, and they'll, you know, holler and scream, and at some point they'll get it if they're authorized. If it's the other one where you're putting, excluding a list of ex people who don't have permission, if you forget to put someone on that, then they will have permission, and they can go in and do whatever they want. Um, the third one is, think about a more complete, uh, systematic and holistic approach. And this is, uh, the, the hackers love getting, this is the one that hackers love to, 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 to get around because people sometimes don't think out of the box and hackers love thinking out of the box. Favorite example is um, when you're trying to break into a website, one of the things that hackers do is they, they automatically assume that the front door is going to be pretty well protected. So, you know, going through, trying to get through the firewall, through that, I mean, that's the part that's where all the fort, you know, the big fort, all, all that good stuff is. So they're like, oh, well, how do I find a back door into it? Well, the people who are these IT folks who might have designed this firewall might not have thought of things holistically. They might be thinking, if I protect this one access point to the Internet and protect it as best I can, then I'm, all, then I'm safe. But guess what? In larger organizations, um, one thing that people like to do these days, uh, it's more frequent in, in larger organizations and, and because of the size of the organization, is they say, oh, I want to actually go home and work on my files at home, and I want to be able to access my computer from home. Oh, and uh, Windows lets me do this. If only it wasn't for that damn firewall that, that doesn't let me through. And then they go, they're walking by CompUSA one day, and they find you know, a cheap $50 modem 
and the light turns on. They go back to their office, plug the modem in, push a few buttons on Windows. They go home, and now they can dial in. Okay, now guess what? That dialing point is a huge, I mean, this guy, these people aren't necessarily security experts, so maybe they didn't even put any passwords on this thing. So what these hackers will do is they'll, they'll get a list of numbers that go into the company, and they'll start calling them. And they'll run, have a computer that does this. And it'll do it, it'll do it at random, you know, so that people, you don't hear like phone number one ringing, phone number two, and so on, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> there have been people caught doing that. <laughs> Um, they'll do it at random, and guess what? They'll find a list of three or four modems, and you know, say let, there's a thousand people in some organization, three or four modems, and one of them will likely have no password, or the password will be password or something something silly. And now they have access trans, you know, now they're in. Okay, this is, and so the IT folks, you know, they weren't thinking holistically about the system. They weren't thinking that there's the network extends throughout the whole company, and it can be connected from any place in the company outside. One thing about Ars Digita, which is, which is funny, and, and, uh, is that you, you guys, they have one of these 802.11b networks, so these wireless, you know, uh, car, you can put a card. And, and so the funny thing is that car berries, it actually, signal actually reaches out to car berries. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, it's great if, you, if you're from Marzidia, you can take your laptop and go and work out there. But now, actually, you, I, there's been people spotted who have nothing to do with Ars Digita, but are over there sipping their coffee and surfing through the Ars Digita. And guess what? Any open shares <laughs> on Windows machines at Ars Digita? Guess, guess who can access them now? The next one is least authority, which is that when you give someone authority to do something, Try to give them the least amount of authority, to, the least amount of authority they need to get their job done, or to the entity that least amount of authority it needs to, to access the shared resources it needs to. Um, and this is kind of like this need to know system in government. It's about least authority. You only you only know even though you're at the same level as somebody else, a top secret or a higher clearance, you only are supposed to know what you need to know. Um, the, the next one is human acceptability. Imagine if someone said, here's a great way to make sure no one's going to get your, no, no one's going to steal your ATM card. What we're going to do is, um, we're not going to, we're going to, we're going to make you, when you walk up to the ATM, you have to put your fingerprint in, you have to do a retinal scan, and then you get a prick on your finger and get a, a, a DNA test. <laughs> That'll make sure, you know, I mean, that's, it's great. It's probably less likely that, you know, someone's going to be able to steal your ATM card and fake all three of those. But guess what? It's completely unacceptable. Similarly, that, I mean, you can imagine there's, there's people who are security, really into security, who want to, who want to make access to certain files very difficult, um, even though they're import, important. But the problem with do, putting too much security in is if you make the, whole, the system less useful as a whole, then security starts getting in the way of getting useful work done, which, which is, which is a, very, it's a big concern for, um, you know, for, for when you're implementing something across a large a larger system, because then changing the thing and taking it back might be quite difficult. And the last thing is immediate feedback. Whenever you find a security fault, you should go back and immediately try to feed what, you, what, what, the, what you've learned back into revising the security. A lot of folks, you know, they'll set up the security system and, oh, someone broke in, and okay, great, we'll just patch that up and we're done. Um, that's usually a mistake because when there's been a break-in, guess what? There might have been other things that, were there, that have been propagated, and there might be a lot of other holes. Use that learning and feed it back. When you read about security and look at security papers, think about these design principles because other, the other value that they have in addition to being design principles is there are ways that hackers, or if you're trying to break the system, there are ways that you can approaches or, or frameworks that you can use to try to figure out security issues. So let's take a simple example of security, which is virtual memory. So remember we talked about one of the things about uh, aspects of virtual memory is you wanted protection. Uh, so or, or, uh, you wanted protection uh, from, uh, of, you wanted one process to be able to be, its memory space to be protected from another process's memory space. So how do you do that? Well, there's several different levels. One is that you have distinct pages for each, for the, the data of, of different processes. So two processes don't share the same page when they're writing data. Well, how do you protect how do you protect these different pages? Well, each page is part of a distinct memory space. So 
different one processes pages are in one memory space and other ones are in another, great. But how do you protect that? Oh, and, and, and the way that you protect that, um, that, you, that you gate that, is um, in the hardware you'll have a, uh, an address register that has the, the page that, uses, uh, that, that you use when you're accessing the page maps. And that's how, whenever you change that, you change to, uh, you do it on a per process basis, you change to another address space. So this, this address, this register, which is in hardware, makes sure that each process can only access its own uh, page map and therefore its own pages. Well, great. So there's this hardware register that, can, that, well, how do you guard that? Well, the way you guard that is you have something in hardware which is called, is called a user or the kernel bit. And this is something that if you have, if that bit is set into kernel mode, then you're authorized to change that page address register. And if it's set in user mode, then you're not authorized to change it. And how do you protect that? Well, you protect that by saying anything that's in kernel mode can only change that to user mode. Anything that's in user mode can only change that to kernel mode. And so that way a user can't, when, when, you, when that gets switched over to kernel mode, the, the processor knows that it needs to run the kernel, type, the kernel program that was initially uh, identified to it when the operating system booted up. So you can, you can keep going on this level, you know, who's going to protect you know, the computer, who's going to protect the, the building that the computer is in, and so on. And you'll find these chains that, that go through. Um, but they all start from, from one trying to secure one shared resource like this. So there's no guarantees that you can actually protect information. And in fact, some, for, in some cases, you actually, protecting information is actually impractical. So let's, one case of that is medical records. Do you really want your medical records, you know, encrypted and sealed and put in some vault somewhere? Yes? <laughs> Excellent. So what, <laughs> what's that? He's an attorney. Oh, he's an attorney. <laughs> um, well, actually, that's not going to get you a lot of money if you're an attorney. You want it to be unprotected, right, so you can have lawsuits. Um, so, uh, so how do you, um, how do you, um, if, if you, I mean, what's the problem, what's the obvious problem if it's, if it's in a vault somewhere and encrypted and... If it's an emergency, you can't get them quickly. Exactly. It's an emergency, you can't get them quickly enough. So actually, I'm wrong. You can, that creates lawsuits, right? If, <laughs> um, so you actually want them at quite readily available. But on the other hand, what, you, you don't want just anybody being able to see them, right? You don't want, you know, if your neighbor is a doctor, you don't want them being able to, to, to look at your files. Um, so what do you, how can you get, how can you provide some measure of security there? Well, the interest, one interesting way to do it is to, is to log access to the, to that shared resource, in this case, the medical records. So what you do is you authenticate someone before they access it, and then you say, you log who, what, when, where, why about that access. So what that means is that now, imagine you're the owner of that medical of that medical record. There's a log that's associated with those medical records. Now what you can do is go back and see who looked at them. So if someone looked at them that you don't think was authorized, then you can use something like the law, you know, the police, the feds, whatever, to go and try to to resolve that situation. Um, so the threat of that punishment then is going to become the, your your de facto security. So th this is this is one way to do that. It's the, it's the same thing for um, for IRS agents, right? IRS agents. This was a big issue. You probably heard a while ago that there was all sorts of instances where they were actually able to find that an IRS agent was was looking at records that they shouldn't have been looking at. In particular, you know, typically it's it's your neighbors and friends. Um, <laughs> you know, you want to know? You want to know? You know? Yes. Mm -hmm. control and would sort of know who was supposed to be looking at what, but now that everything has been computerized, um, there's, there's no system in place to, uh, to govern who ought to have access to what or, you know, or when support, particularly to watch for people who are looking at things that they maybe oughtn't to be. Yeah, and, I, and that's actually for a government, from a government and also from just any institution that's been around for a while. Though this is exactly why this is becoming more of an issue because there used to be used to information access used to be more controlled when it was paper based, and as it's becoming more electronic, it's the same systems that worked for the paper base don't tend to offer the same kind of security that 
that you that the same type of security in the electronic world. There was um, there's a professor who a few years ago, um, Peter Solovitz at MIT, he was uh, working with the uh, the Mayo Clinic, and one of the problems, security problems they had there was. Uh, well, they, I mean, tip, their system actually is quite amazing. Apparently, they have these tubes that go all around the, this Mayo Clinic, and they, someone puts some medical files here in some tube, and, and it's actually paper, and then this tube, you know, kind of has a, it's a little container, and it whisks it off somewhere else, and, and they, 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 what's that? It's like a drive in the bank. Yeah, it's like, it is, it is, and it, apparently, he says it's actually quite amazing. Um, but even then, he said, because of the, this system, even though it's paper-based, you have these things whizzing all over the place, and anyone can request one of these because you know you never know who's who their next doctor might be to, to see you, and they might need it. Um, so the issue, because of the fact that these things whizzed around and there was no librarian, then you had this security issue come up again. And so they, he was helping them develop some system like this, where you would be, have to, lo if you were looking at someone's records, you would need to have some log of the fact that you did, so that later on the patient could could search and make sure that nothing was act that, that their rights hadn't actually been violated. A very simple example of this: um, suppose that you have you know you have a room and 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 you're sharing a, a three bedroom with someone, and suppose that you're you know all three of you are working at different startups and and actually they end up being competing startups and so you have all this proprietary stuff in your room and you don't want your your roommates to come in. Now one of your roommates all of a sudden has a really bright idea and says, "Hey." Um, the fire escape is out of your bedroom, isn't it? Well, you know, I guess that means that you, you know, you should make you should make it easy for us to be able to get into your bedroom in case there's a fire, right? So what do you do using this type of uh, this type of, of security to make sure that they don't just happen to come in, uh, you know, and check it out? Well, one thing you could do is you could put some kind of fancy alarm on your door to detect, you know, when when they come in, but you know, maybe you don't want that because if they if there's a fire and they come in and something goes off and you know it can be an issue. But what's a very simple, low, the simplest, low cost way that you can you can do this? Break the fire alarm. Break the fire alarm. <laughs> well, <laughs> and still keep. And, what's that? I said, let them burn to death. Break let the, the fire alarm. <laughs> yeah. Switch rooms. Switch rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, imagine you did the following, which was imagine that you had a key and you just said, you said, here's the key to my room. I'm going to make it available and I'm going to put it in a well-known place so anybody who needs to get in there, you know, something you smell smoke, you can you can get out. What you do is you take that key and you seal it in some kind of envelope, staples and stuff like that. So now the thing is, it's not that they can't get into your room. But it's that if they do, they're going to have to rip open this big envelope, which is now big and prominent, so anyone can find it, right, and grab the key. And so you'll be able to ask them, why did you come into the room? It doesn't prevent, this, you know, prevent them from breaking the security, but it allows you to know when they did. The problem I see with this system is distraction is very reactive. In other words, you don't, you're not preventing the thing from happening in the first place, which wouldn't necessarily be a problem if you could be sure of the identity of the person. But then there's always just using a misnomer. Well, this this approach here is is reactive in the sense that you it, it, the reason you you need to use this sometimes is because this approach is because it's too impractical to try to so for I mean it's too impractical like in the medical records you don't want to secure the medical records so much that they aren't instantly accessible when there's an emergency and the, and the doctor needs to see them right. so that so but so the your recourse in that case is to be able to make sure no one sees them by putting some huge penalty for if they get caught. The, the authentication is a really important part of that. The That's right. Missing from that envelope example. That's right. So if, like you said, if you could use a fake name, then it's totally it's, it's yeah. worthless security, right? But if, if you're guaranteed, however, that, that the person... Right. And like in the medical record place, you know, you, you have, it, it might be too cumbersome to authenticate yourself as a doctor, right? But if you could pre-authenticate yourself uh, pre-authenticate the hospital, um, then at the very least there's an entity there who's very well incented not to violate the security protocols because if they do, you can sue them. Uh, so that the whole point is to make sure that you set up the system so that there are these checks and balances to disincent the security from being uh, violated uh, without authorization. Yes? Mm-hmm. 
Unless, unless, unless you have two keys, one in, a, one in two of each of two boxes or n boxes, and you give each of the different boxes and you give each of them. There's a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Copy, you replace your lock and cost yeah. Then they do it again. Right. Again and again. Right. Right. So, so there's no. So there, are, there are no. You know, everything, everything costs. You know, there's anything is. I mean, there's nothing that's foolproof, right? There's always some way to get around it. Nanny cams is one way. You you put some kind of, uh, you know, secret camera somewhere, and you give them this key thing, and then they think they can get away with it, and then, you, right? I mean, so secure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You guys talked about cryptography, which is a way when you actually do want to prevent someone from getting your data, there's a notion of cryptography to change, to convert your data, which is known as plain, the original data, which is known as plain text, into something that's encrypted, which is ciphered text. Now, did you guys talk about how different attack modes to try to get, to try to bypass encryption? Okay. So I'll go, I'll go through. There's, there's, if you think about how you might actually try to break someone's encryption, there's six main categories uh, of, of attack. Um, one of them is called ciphertext only, which means that you have access to the ciphertext, and you, but you don't know what plain text, for example, created that ciphertext. So you just see stuff, encrypted data coming out of some pipe, or you get some page with a, 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 something that's encrypted. The next one is, is, is known as known plain text. And what that means is that in addition to having the ciphertext, you actually know what the plain text was that created that ciphertext. So now you have, so now you just have to find out what was, you know, what, what happened in the middle, how one got converted into the other. Do you have a question? I just didn't understand. You have the original source? Yeah, you have the original plain text. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the, the reason is because there's other data that you want to decrypt. So imagine that you have that you have one set of uh, that, let's say let's say you had your name encrypted and so you say based on the fact that I have my name encrypted, I'm going to try to find out what the what the from in future ciphertext what the plain text was that corresponded to it. Um, the next level up is chosen ciphertext. So that's where you um, you the, you can you have you can choose what the ciphertext what the plain text is that's being converted into ciphertext. Um, and then there's adaptive chosen, play, uh, adaptive chosen plain text, which is that is a, it's a subset of the chosen plain text, in which you can actually it's more it's a little bit of a feedback loop. So suppose that you were able to feed in a piece of plain text and get back a piece of cipher text, and based on what you learned there, you put in another piece of plain text and got back another piece of cipher text, and based on what you learned there, and you just and you kept doing this. Um, there is the other side of that, which is chosen ciphertext. So imagine if you could say, I'm choosing the ciphertext. Now you tell me what the plain text is associated with it. Um, that, one that, one, that one seems a little bit. If that were adaptive, you'd be done. Yeah, and so if it's, if it's adaptive, if you had adaptive um, ciphertext, then you, then you can basically give any piece of ciphertext over. The thing there that you, um, that you might want to do if you have an adaptive ciphertext is actually try to find, if you can find the key, Right, then you can use it to start breaking, break another level, you know, break another level deeper into the encryption system. For RSA, um, what type of what type of attack do you think um, you would you could try out? Or let's let's sorry, step back. For the public key encryption system, what type of attack? If you have my public key, what can you do? Pardon? You can try and factor it, but if you try, what, what, which of these attacks could you could you do? Because suppose you you know you want to find if there's any weaknesses in the key. It's adaptive, not, plain adaptive plain text. Because you can choose any plain text you want and then convert it into cipher text, and then based on what you learn there, you can keep doing that. Have you guys gotten over this? The the whole public and private key encryption. Yeah. No, yes, no. <laughs> yeah, but we've never really understood it. Message from Mars. Message from Mars. Well, let's, um, okay, why don't I, what I'll do is, why don't I cover this? Why don't I go a little bit quickly through this, and then I'll expect, there's certain key things that I, that you should know, which is that, um, 
this the third bullet here, which is that a message that if you encrypt the key with the with the with a secret key, if you encrypt the message with a secret key, you can decrypt it with the public key. And if you encrypt the message with a public key, you can decrypt it with the secret key. Okay, so that's what's the thing that's really interesting about this is that you can use that fact to do two things with once you know someone's public key. You can secure communications and you can use it for some form of, of authorization. So why doesn't someone tell me why how you can use it to secure communication if I have if I have your public key? Yes. If you want to send me a message, you can encrypt it and send it to me. Right. That's right. So if I have your public key, which is ava should be available to anyone, I can just encrypt the message using your public key, and then you, who know your your um, secret key, gets that message and then decrypts it. Okay. Pardon? It's well. Email systems can some. I mean, your public key is your address. Your you you you're actually your public key is your um is a, is something that you can. It's a, a string of bits that you can get you, that's accessible to anybody. Uh, so hopefully that can send you an email if they want to send it to you encrypted with it. But your secret key is something that you have inside. Oh, you're, you're are you making an analogy to? Yeah, like a username and a oh, but the second thing is the thing that you can't do with email, which is, which is, imagine that I want to know, imagine that I got a message and some, and, and I wanted to know that it was from you, right? Like if I, if you're sending me a message and you're saying, and you want the person to know that it came, that it came from you, what, what you would do is you would send me that message encrypted with your secret key. And then when I get it, then I'll, what I'll do is I'll take it and I'll say, well, I'm going to apply your public key, which I know, and if and if I get back, you know, if I, I get back something that I'm expecting from you, then I know that it that this was, uh, or if I get if I can decrypt this into something, you know, intelligible even, um, it's, there's a good chance that it was from you. Right now, that doesn't. That assumes that your secret key has not been compromised, because once your secret key is compromised, all bets are off. But notice that there's this there's this interesting symmetry in the sense that w if you do it one way, you do you do encrypted communication. If you do this a different way, you can get some kind of authentication. Yes. So you make sure in the second case that no one has changed the message in the way. Small change. I mean, you have encrypted someone in the mail. The way he said, oh, yes, make a couple of things. Right. Okay. It's not the same thing he said, but it's kind of making sense. Okay. Well, one of the, what you can do is, um, in, when I initially contact you, I can send you, a, I can take, I can send you, the first message that I send you can be what's called a nonce. And you'll see this later on in the notes. So I can send you a random number that I pick. And I can send I can send that over to you now. If you have if you actually you know have the secret key, then you take my you can figure out what that nonce is, and then what you s then send me back is that nonce uh, it, with something else in there like hello or you know encrypted. And when I get that back, I need to find that nonce in there. Now if I make any change here, a good cipher will 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 ha have this turn into complete random you know just completely unintelligible random stuff. So there, but you're getting to where we're going, which is you need to be able to. You, there's way, there's lots of good ways to use this type of this type of back and forth and layer stuff on top, depending on what you put in here, to get authentication. Let's talk about server media authentication. Now, remember, it used to be the case that um, you didn't have this nice symmetry of you know public and and private keys being able to, to be used to, to encrypt and decrypt in this way. Um, before, when you would communicate, you'd have to have some kind of shared secret, right? So you'd have like the passcode or something, and it was this one shared secret that you would have to communicate to somebody else. Now, the problem with that and the reason that uh, Reves and company, uh, the reason that they, they were so successful with this is that this doesn't require you to have a shared secret in a sense uh, because the, the public key is something that's widely available. Uh, so 
what, so back, what you needed in order to communicate securely was um, server-mediated authentication. And you can, these, you can also use um, a public or private key system uh, now with this, It'll, and it makes it stronger, but there still can be a need for it. So what happens in server-mediated authentication? Well, you have a trusted server, and you have two users who want to communicate securely. So what you do is uh, A will go to the trusted server and say, I want to communicate to B. And so what does B return? So B will return the session key, which is some kind of, of it can either be a shared secret or it can be some kind of, of special uh, key just for that communication that's going to happen. And the the uh, and that that's encrypt and the uh, key for A put B up here and it's going to seal that with B's key and then it's going to send that along with the session key sealed with A's key. So this is the message that gets sent back to A. So what is A going to do with it? Well, A is going to pull out the session key. So now it has a key to communicate with B with. That's a, a one-time key that's going to be used for this session. So it gets thrown away afterwards. It helps you secure the communication better. And then this here is something that it's going to send to B. So what happens when B gets this? Well, when B gets this, it's going to say, oh, this thing has, is something that I have, I have a session key that I need, that I can use to communicate with A. And there'll be routing information that, so that you can go back and forth. So now B is going to get this information. Now they both have a session key and they can both start, that, that was sent securely. And now they can both start communicating. Did mm -hmm. B get a session key from A or from the server? It gets it from A. So this this part here is what gets sent from A to B. Which is a subscript represent? That means it's uh, that means it's B's key and it's been sealed with B's. When I put these brackets around, it means this is a message and this is the key that it was sealed with, and that's B's key. That's still B's public key. In the in a public private key uh, encryption system, um, this would be the server would seal this with B's public key. If it's if you're using shared secrets, then what happens is that the trusted server needs to know the keys, the actual A's and B's and everybody's keys so that it's. Hacked, that's right, that's right. And in fact, even now, um, what's one of the ways that that you could if you hacked into TS? Suppose you had a public private key infrastructure, so you, the trusted server doesn't even know what the what the uh, secret keys are. What's one way that you could uh, try to uh, try to uh, uh, compromise the communication between A and B. Just monitor the session keys. Yeah. You masquerade as B masquerade by and provide some other key to, to A and pretend to be B and then. Yeah, but uh, assume that this guy is able to get the. I mean, if you were if you were here and you and you had to be able to send a, a message with B's encrypted with B's public key, mm -hmm. right as A. Then B would know that. I mean, if you change this key, then. Well, I mean, but you would you would then you would also pose as B on the network somewhere. Oh, so you're saying compromise both of the yeah. like this, and then have some kind of man in the middle attack, as it's called. Yeah, you could do something like that. But if you were just suppose that you just had access to TS, what could you do? And you wanted someone. Uh, yeah. You could do a really really short message, and with that short message, server A, it might actually come out like a. Hi, or something. It might actually come out to be a word, so I'd be like, "All right, I'll respond." And you can get A's key. Well, you can. What you can do is, I mean, you're getting at, at something which is trying to attack a piece of this, which is the session key. Like, imagine if you if you picked a short session key, or if you picked a. Imagine if you picked a session key so that it was cryptographically weak, right? And you started issuing these. Would A and B, you know, would they really know this? Maybe not, right? And maybe someone else could could sit on that and and listen to this. 
and, and listen to this conversation and start trying to break that key without TS even giving that so key to somebody else. Want to just, want to just be simpler just to know what the session keys that they're sending out are? Yeah, uh, but that, but that, and, but, right, if you hacked into TS and you were handing out and you were sending out session keys, then it might look a little bit suspicious depending on how many you were sending out. So if you wanted to protect yourself more as the hacker, right, and make it more difficult for someone to know that this has been hacked, the trade-off here in this case, if you fix the session keys, is that you still have to do some work if you can sniff these packets. But it's a lot harder for, for someone to know that TS is doing anything really bad. Right? So this is another one of these, the negative results. Right? If TS, I mean, there's, there's a lot of these, I mean, some of these viruses that you get, one of the ways you catch them is you start looking at your, at your modem and it's like sending all this stuff. And you're like, what the heck? You know, what's going on here? Um, and so you, it's yet another way, and if you're a security expert, one of the things you look at is sort of spurious traffic coming out or, or traffic that you don't expect. Um, and if, if you, if you want to get around, if you don't want to get caught that way, then one way is just to say, let's make the keys themselves weak. Okay, any questions on that? How do you sniff packets? Um, it depends on the, uh, let's see. It depends on the, um, on, the, on the mechanism. If you're, for example, if it's a wireless network, then you can, you can you know, have an ant put an antenna out and see what's, oh, sorry. <laughs> Neil. Neil, okay. Um, you can put an antenna out and, and see and hear the, the you know, EM that's coming through. If it's a wired network, uh, you, can actually, it's, it's, you can actually put some, there's some gadgets that you can actually put across the wire to, to read what's going through. If you, if you go talk to any of these network admins, they have these great things, which is they'll, they'll put this little gadget on and they'll be able to tell something about that traffic. Um, you could do that. Uh, you could, um, if, you're, uh, if you have access to some of the tunnel, you know, the, the tunnels that, I, that, that are used to house fiber, I mean, um, fiber will be a lot harder. But a higher, to have any of the coax cable, for example, that's connected to your cable modem eventually, you could sniff packets that way. So there's, anytime there's a shared link that makes it, that, that exposes the, or, or a, a link that isn't secure, which would be a long haul link, um, those are two easy ways to try to, to try to get in. Okay. Yeah, a question? Okay. All right. With the long haul link, you're going to have so much traffic going on it that it would just get lost in the jumble, wouldn't it? Well, that's why it's funny. You have something like uh, Carnivore. I mean, these, you, what you do is you put, um, when you sniff these packets, because they're running on standard or well-known protocols, you can decipher each one. And you can know where it's going, right? And you can look. And so unless you have some custom protocol that you've developed, it's pretty easy for these things to, to try to figure out, to match, you know, amongst the fixed set of protocols that it's looking at, you know, what, it, what kind of a packet is this? Right. But then you get hosed with all the other network problems, which is imagine if there's congestion in that line and you start sending some other datagrams on some other link, right? It's, you can get, you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that you'll be able to, to sniff all the packets for a given message. And there's a standard called uh, X509, which is used by SSL, which we'll discuss shortly, which is SSL is the, is a secure sockets layer that browsers like Netscape uh, Internet Explorer, all the modern browsers use. And a certificate uh, is, is somewhat like a table, like we were talking yesterday, where it's issued by a well-known um, certificate authority like VeriSign. You can actually go to VeriSign and, and apply for a personal certificate. And at least a while ago, they used to give them to you for free uh, if you're per for personal use. But they would go through this huge uh, mechanism to authenticate you. So you had to, I don't know what you had to give them, your social security and copy of your, you know, all, all sorts of information before they would uh, issue you this certificate. So uh, what does a certificate uh, typically contain? Well, a certificate has the issuer's name or some kind of identifying uh, material. It has and a signature. And then it also has the um, issuee, issuee's name, and their key, and um, some valid dates, and some admin information. Well, what is 
signature mean here? We're, we're going to get to that. Um, so what happens is when you go to someone like Amazon, Amazon or, or you're trying to do e-commerce over SSL, you'll get something like this back. And this will be Amazon, this will be their key, this will be VeriSign and their signature. And so now you as the client, you have to figure out, well, do I, what am I going to do with this certificate to make sure that I'm actually talking to the right Amazon.com machine? So the first thing you do is you say, I need to, it's a, basically a two-step process. One is to validate the certificate. And once you've used that, then you can start communicating with the, with the key. So establish So how do you validate this certificate? Well, I'll just give you an example. Um, imagine that uh, you have the, uh, well, one thing you have to assume first is that you have the public key of, of something like VeriSign, of the issuer. And you, that has to be something that you trust as an assumption, is that you have the right public key. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can make sure that's the case. Um, so assuming that you have that, imagine that you sent to VeriSign that signature one of these things, uh, and uh, and your um, and your key, and then you seal that with the key of the issuer. And this again, this this is the key, the public key that we assume that you have. So suppose you send that off to Verisign. Well, you're give it, what you uh, what you assume is that Verisign will be able to decrypt this. And what they'll do with this signature, this signature is something they've previously encrypted uh, with their uh, secret key. So this is K um, issuer secret. This is K issuer public. And what it contains is something that corresponds to this particular certificate. So it'll have something like the issuer's name, or issuee's name, the valid dates, yes? I'm sorry, just, mm -hmm. just to set up your context, this is something a user would do when they get on Amazon to make sure they're talking with them? This is something the user's client does for them. So, Am so Netscape, when you click onto, oh. eight, when, you, when you go onto HTTPS, it's a protocol that uses secure socket layer, and so it does this for you. So issues name, the valid dates, um, say the key of the, the of the issuee, their public key of course, and then, what's that? Question? Uh, on here it says to verify need to securely obtain secured authorities, uh, certificate authorities public key. Right. Now that wouldn't be VeriSign. It sounds like it would be VeriSign. No, that would be VeriSign. Well, that conflicts with what uh, we heard in a guest lecture uh, a week or two ago, which uh, basically he said that um, Netscape contains the certificate of authority's public key. Right, well that's, for, but, for the, right, but that's, that's that, right, that's what I was going to get to, which is that the way that you be sure, the way that you're sure that it's the right public key is that it usually comes built into the program. Okay, and the program like Netscape or Internet Explorer will have these keys built in because if you actually go and try to get them, like if you try to get them through the network, yeah, right? That's good. but if you try to if they're if they're already embedded, then that's okay. But the point is, is that you have to there has to be something that you trust, right? right? And you have to trust that the Netscape program you got actually has their public right. key because I could give you a Netscape program that has you know my public key, and then when you go off to and I could you know if I enter if I'm the man in the middle, I do a man in the middle attack, then then. You know, you, even though it's embedded, you'll still be in trouble. So that, but but that's that's in, in general, you have to. It come, that's the way that you secure it. And if you're really, um, if so you're really in paranoid, cases would someone actually do this lookup that you're describing? Here? So in the case that you would do this lookup is if you go um, and uh, this uh, certificate authority is one that you ha isn't recognized by default in your. So there can be, VeriSign isn't the only one that's, that's out there. There can be others. And so what will happen is, I don't know if you've ever clicked on one of these things, and you get this thing saying certificate. You know, you have to accept the certificate. Well, that's what you're doing is you're verifying that 
this you're actually looking at a certificate and you're trying to verify that this is that you know that you actually believe this is for real and it'll give you some information about the certificate like it'll tell you that this type of thing here and if you don't believe it you can actually call the people up as one way um, to, to see if it's for real people tend not to do that they just click yes 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 and, and go through um, but there's I mean that that's what happens when you don't when it isn't built in so VeriSigns is, is I mean They've got a sweet deal. They're built in. That's why you never see these things pop up when you first boot up Netscape. If it wasn't, then when you first booted it up, it would take you through that whole process. So suppose that somebody was locking and cracked VeriSign's public key, then they would know the private key of like a thousand and thousand people? Well, they would, um, yeah. If, well, if they cracked it, then they could fake being a certificate no, authority. The if, they if they cracked the, the key, you're, you're saying yeah, if they yeah, got the, yeah. you mean if they got the secret key, right? If they got VeriSign's secret key, um, well, what would happen is that there would be a lot of, uh, they could spoof being, spoof being uh, a VeriSign because they could start issuing certificates. Because when one of these dates, when the, one of these things expires, right, when you have these certificates here which are issued to you from VeriSign, right, when they expire, you have to go back to VeriSign and get another one. Yeah, but they don't get, they'll get the, the key from, from the client. Suppose they're like, they still don't have any private keys of anybody. Yeah, they don't have, VeriSign doesn't have anyone's. When you send these messages, right, I can interrupt those messages probably fairly easily. So I can have a big database. Mm -hmm. And then if one day somebody, somebody find out what is the private key of VeriSign, I can, I can get the private well, key these, of these are, uh, these are, um, these are actually, this, is, this means public. And they're, they're secret. Yeah, this one, this one here is, is the client's public key also. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, so you don't have to, you don't send ever your private key. Yeah, you never send your, never send your, you give your shit, your secret key to anybody. Just your, your, you give your public key out. Okay. Um, so what you can do here is, make sure I'm copying all this. Um, I always want to give some kind of unique ID. And you steal this with the, uh, this is sealed with the secret key of the issuer. That's what this signature is. So let's remember, this is the thing, let's, if you want to, uh, if you want to verify that this is, the certificate is valid, you take, you create a message like this. You s this thing here, as we discussed, you either have to get it if you don't know it, through this, through the, certi you know, the certificate popping up, or if it's built in, then you implicitly uh, trust it. You see, you send that to the issuer, and what the issuer does is it decrypts this message and says, "Okay, it looks like somebody's giving me a signature, which is something that I've uh, that I that I know about. They're giving me a nonce, and they're giving me their their um, public key." And what I'm going to return back to this client, which is your Netscape browser, is I'm going to take this signature, and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to decrypt it for them, and I'm going to turn it into the issuee's name, the valid dates, this, and I'm also going to throw the nonce in there that you sent me, and I'm going to encrypt that with I'm going to de I'm going to send that over to um, the uh, back to the the clients, and I'm going to encrypt that. with the client's public key. So this is what the signature, the signature contains some of this stuff. You can use the signature then to, you decrypt the signature. Actually, this is wrong, sorry. What, what it does, the, what the server does, what the um, VeriSign server will do is it'll take the signature, it'll suck things out of this information out of it, it'll decrypt it, and then it'll throw that into it'll throw that into a message. Throw that into a message along with the nonce, and then use the the client's public key to send that back to you. So this is what the signature looks like. The signature is this, which, is, which was originally encrypted by VeriSign or the, the issuer with their secret key. I'm, let me see. Sorry, with their public key. 
Why is it they're public, not their secret? No, because you don't want anyone else to be able to decrypt it, right? So that's how you protect it. And so when you get this back, you say, oh, okay, so now I was able to, um, I got this signature, I sent it off to somebody who I trust because I had their public, you know, sealed with their public key. I got back something that matches, matches what's in the, what's in the certificate. I got back my nonce to make sure there's no kinds of replays or make sure this, this is a one-time thing. Um, and, uh, and so now I know that this certificate is valid. So now what I can do is I can take this key and start communicating. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There's um there's in the readings actually in the textbook they talk about they give a lot of examples of this kind of thing. Um, the main thing that you have to understand that, that, that this becomes a little bit more intuitive when you if you have this sort of private the the private and I mean the public and secret key and you remember that the reason you seal something in a public key that you send out is that because you want to make sure that it's that when someone's going to be able to send it back to you and to verify that you were the one who actually sealed it to begin with. Um, when you seal something with your secret key and send it out, it's because you want someone else to know that it's it was you who actually sent it. So so that's if you if you keep remember those two things that I put up before, if you keep those two things in mind and what they're for, um, whenever you see something like you know message sealed with public then look at the other side of that arrow and see, well, it's because someone else wants to do X with it. That's why you do it. So that's, that's if you think about it that way, these things start making a little bit more intuitive sense. Now, there's always, you know, there's, there's holes you can poke in this. Like one of them was, you know, can you really trust this public key or not? Well, I could give you a fake, you know, a boot, some kind of rogue version of Netscape that has something that in there that is, uh, that has, my own, uh, you know, key in there, and that, that's one way I could get around that. I could break into your computer and put and change that where that's stored, and that's another way I can I can get around that. So there's there's still some at some level there's still more protection to be done, but at that point, you know, the cost of doing it starts becoming prohibitive compared to why the information you're trying to protect. Could you repeat the purpose that you would steal something with the uh, public key? I thought. Well, in this case, the um, the signature that's in this that's in this certificate, you seal it with the public with your own public key, because the signature is something that you don't want someone else to alter. So, if you don't want someone else to alter, the only way they can alter it is if they can decrypt it and see what's inside that message. And so, if you sealed it with your secret key, then they, anyone with your public key can decrypt it. So, you seal it with your public key. They, so and that they, they just repackage that whole thing when they send, when they send it to you. And you can decode it. That's right. Okay. That's right. So you never send anything out encrypted with your secret key unless you expect the world, unless you want the world to be able to read it and know it comes from you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, that we, uh, when was it? About six months ago, eight months ago? Uh, Clinton signed in to affect the piece of legislation that allowed you to use digital signatures. And, uh, and they can rely on, on you know, public key type systems like this. Um, but now in, in it's, a, it's allowable for you to sign certain types of documents using some kind of digital signature, which can use this type, this, these types of ideas. Right? You can take a, a hash, for example, of, of, a, of a document and use that as part of uh, a digital signature. Mm -hmm. The nonce in the original uh, message is sent out. That message is not going to be decoded <coughs> until it gets back to the original signature. So how does this nonce in the second? Uh, oh, what you so? well, what you do? This nonce here is the same as this one, and you send that nonce, which can be like a timestamp, uh -huh. um, to to prevent replay of messages. So. But it, since that that, inch, that packet that's inside the, the curly braces in the first one never gets this opened one. until it gets back to the original sender, right? It's no, been, it's been no you, you actually send this to the issuer. That whole package. Yeah, the whole this. The, the, the public key, so the whole package is going to be 
just the signature is coded that way. Yeah, just the signature piece is coded this way. So really the curly braces should uh, should only be around the signature. No, yeah, you're, what you're doing is the, is your Netscape client. Your Netscape client, because your Netscape client received this this certificate here, and it says, okay, what do I have? What does this certificate tell me? Well, it gives me the signature here, of, and it tells me this is, let's say it's VeriSign's signature. So guess what? I know VeriSign's public key, so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to make sure that this certificate here actually is something that VeriSign sent to Amazon. So how do I make sure that it was actually VeriSign that sent this to Amazon, and it wasn't someone else who sent it to Amazon? Well, the way that I do that is I say, well, I have a signature here, which is VeriSign's some piece, some bit string that, that I can't de uh, decrypt. And then I have the name of VeriSign. Inside Nets my Netscape client, it turns that, it can turn that name into, directly into a public, into the VeriSign's public key. So now what I do as Netscape, as a Netscape is I put this message together, which is the signature, which to me is a black box. Some nonce. And then I include my public key in there. And I seal that all up with VeriSign's key and send it off. So what I'm doing when I send it off to VeriSign is I'm saying, okay, I'm assuming VeriSign is going to be, is the only person that's going to be able to break this message up into these three pieces. The second thing that what, that once VeriSign, so once um, we get to the issuer, um, this signature is something that the issuer says, oh, this is something that I previously encrypted. And what did I? And so I'm going to try to decrypt it now. So when I decrypt it, decrypt it as VeriSign, then I say, oh well, okay, it has the name of the issuee, which is Amazon. It has the dates that I that I originally stuffed in that certificate. It has um, the Amazon's uh, key that they wanted to use to communicate their public key. And I'm going to send those things back to Net to, to the Netscape client, along with the nonce. Because I to prove that I was able to decrypt their their request, um, and I'm going to seal that all up with the, with your Netscape client's public key. So now when I'm the Netscape client, I get this back, and how do I know, how do I verify this? Well, I say the only re way I could have gotten this back is if VeriSign had decrypted this, decrypted this signature. Um, I didn't tell VeriSign who I was that I was trying to communicate with Amazon. Yet they came back with Amazon's name. They came back with the same valid dates that it was over here. They also came back with a key, right? So that you can use. You can even say, well, if, you, if you're sending this key back, you can even say, well, I'm just going to use that one and not even use this one over here. If the key, if you're not sending the key back, so it's not it's not strictly required. You can just you know take that off or use that. Sorry, use that one. So now that I'm Netscape, now I get now I now what I don't know is that this certificate is valid. In that case, how did uh, VeriSign know that it was Amazon.com that it was supposed to send it back for? Because the signature here that I'm giving it oh, okay. was which 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 Amazon. yeah. Okay. So Amazon originally got this this thing here from from VeriSign, okay. and and Amazon sends this out to whatever browser wants to authenticate. Okay, if you have questions about this, I'll you know let's go over it um, after lecture and. We can go at it, uh, go over it as much as you want because this, getting a feel for this type of thing, is one of the important pieces of deciding how to how to build these types of systems. So the last thing, SSL. So this is the, the certificate piece, is what SSL is built on top of. So what SSL does is it says, let's first exchange certificates. Um, the the certificate between a client, so the server you're trying to communicate to Amazon. So the client goes to Amazon and says, "Give me your certificate." So Amazon comes back with a certificate, and then the client will verify it using this process, and then we'll say, "Oh, great!" Now there's a step here, which is a step where a client could actually send a certificate it generates over to the to Amazon. It isn't um, necessarily required, but it, it's part of it's something that you can do with the with the protocol. Um, 
Now the uh, if you do if this second piece here is done, it's usually usually you want to do this kind of thing. Like if you're two if you're two business entities or two uh, where where the transaction is going to matter even more, what you want to do is make sure you cross authenticate. Like Amazon doesn't care if you're be, if you're faking your, you know your identity as being someone else's. What they care about is credit card fraud, right? And they don't care if you know you're typing in your your spouse's <coughs> password. I mean that's to them as long as they're getting the money and as long as this, it's not fraudulent. They don't care, but if you're suppose you're doing a business-to-business -business transaction, right? You don't necessarily want to be paying someone, you know, someone who you're not really doing business with. In that case, you'd want the exchange to take place, and then the other side would go through this authentication mechanism to verify the identity of the of of the uh, client in this case. Um, so once you've done that, the next step you do is you exchange messages to establish what cipher you're going to use. Now, SSL is, is uh, flexible in that it allows you to use different types of ciphers. So they knew that it's possible that ciphers can be broken, and they didn't want this protocol to be limited, its lifetime to be limited by the cryptographic strength of, the, of today's ciphers. And one of the things that you do in that step is you exchange some what are called pre-master keys. And these pre-master keys can be random numbers that are generated on each side, and together they use to establish a session key. And, depend, that, and the session key will depend on whatever cipher you're using. If you're using the IDEA cipher, uh, cipher from, NS, from RSA, or if you're using um, uh, Blowfish, or, or whatever it might be, you might have you will you'll use this these set of random numbers to generate a different session key. Now, once you've established a session key, session key is something that's valid only for that session, for that SSL session. And once you've, you're done communicating back and forth, then you just drop it on the floor and get rid of it. That means that if someone is able to figure out that session key, you know, a year later, it's not going to matter. You'll be, you'll have gone through many session keys by then and won't be using it. Um, so that's how, that's, that's the essence of how SSL works. Any questions on that? But, but, but you can, but by, by, by the, if, if you store the communication and you break it, then a year later you can. You can find out what the communication was about. Yeah, you can you can find out what was what happened if you store it. Yeah, you can find out. So then you get back to this whole time value of data, which is that a year later, is it worth it? Was that is it is that information worth anything? And how much how much and how much did it cost you to break that? Because maybe the cost of you breaking that is more than what you get out of it. But if it was a credit card that had a hundred dollar credit limit, and it cost you you know you bought a five hundred dollar computer to break it a year later, then you're then you. One of the, you know, you're not going to be making a lot of money. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I believe that is it. Okie doke.